The first sexual villain in the Bible, or should we say the first sensual, erotic villain in the Bible, <coughs> is the mother of all life. And Adam called Eve, Eve kihi haisa ein kolchai, for she was the mother of all life. Villain because she is seduced. Creation begins with an act of, act of seduction. Now I have learned something in the many marital counseling sessions in which I have participated. Counseling couples in various parts of the world. I have learned that one cannot seduce a wife who is happy. One can only seduce a wife who is depressed. A woman has to be miserable. She has to feel a form of neglect. It's not true for men, by the way. This is a, an accurate statistic. 84% of husbands who cheat on their wives claim to love their wives. They can be happily married. And still they cheat. Why did you cheat? You're happy. I'm also a man. <laughs> that about explains it all, but it's not true for women. Women are unfaithful in marriage if they are unhappy, if they are somehow dissatisfied. Their cup is half full. They do not feel that they are brimming to the top with satisfaction, erotic focus, romantic desire. And it's actually the genius of the serpent to see that Eve can be seduced. He sees that she's unhappy. Why is Eve unhappy? She has everything and she's miserable, so she is seduced. The first sexual sin in the Bible, leading to the fall of man. What does she want? And the answer? Romance. The one thing your parents cannot give you. Your parents can love you, nurture you, dress you, compliment you, support you, educate you. But they cannot choose you. When your mother says you're the prettiest girl in the whole class, you don't believe her. <laughs> you know she has a genetic AK-47 pointed right to her head that's making her say it. But when a boy in the class comes and says you're the prettiest girl, you believe him because you are now chosen. Now why is Eve so miserable? Eve has everything but nothing. All we want in life is to be special and feel special. That's why we pursue love. That's why we pursue erotic desire. We want someone to desire us. We want to be wanted, need to be needed, desire to be desired. And it's the one thing that's denied her because Adam can compliment her, love her, communicate with her, intimate, be intimate with her, but he cannot choose her because she's the only one. And the serpent sees it. He sees a woman who doesn't feel chosen. So he seduces her. Everyone wants to feel chosen. And that is why we engage in romantic and sexual relationships, because it's the one thing that sets us apart, <coughs> the one and the only, giving us primacy and exclusivity. And all sexual heroes and villains in the Bible come down to one of those categories. Was I made to feel chosen, or was I not? So now, let's move on. And Adam and Eve were both naked. They were not ashamed of their nakedness. Adam and Eve parading around the room with all their privates dangling and they have no shame. Maimonides says that a man came over to him and asked him one of the most powerful questions of his rabbinic career. This is in the Moran of Bukhim, the Guide to the Perplexed. Maimonides said the question was so good he had to take a few days to think about the response. This is what he asked. Adam and Eve are naked in the Garden of Eden. And then they sin and lose their innocence, and they are rewarded for their sin. So Adam, why did God reward them? So my mom and he said to him, no, they weren't uh, rewarded, they were, they were punished. She was pu punished with the, the, the pangs of, of labor. He was punished by the rebellion of the earth that would grow thorns and thistles and would pushed back against his attempts to dominate the earth. And the man said, no, 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 no. If you look in the story, 
prior to the sin, they had no knowledge of their nakedness, and right after the sin, by yeduki arumimim, they grew up. Little children don't know that they're naked. As they get older, they become conscious of it. So they were rewarded with wisdom, knowledge, and maturity. My mom, they said this was such a brilliant question, it took him days to think about the response. He came back to the man and he gave an even more ingenious response. He said, whenever it comes to sex and physical attraction, there are always two things, subjective attraction and objective attraction. Objective attraction is, am I someone who is comfortable in my body? Do I feel comfortable looking in a mirror? And I, I, I understand my age, I understand whether I'm young or older, and I'm comfortable through that entire process. It's an objective scale about how I measure myself with regards to an ultimate truth. I don't judge myself compared to someone else, someone who's taller, has larger breasts, lo larger, longer legs, bluer eyes, blonder hair. I look in the mirror and all the ghosts of lovers past disappear. I look objectively and therefore I feel no shame because I feel no sense of inadequacy. All shame results from a feeling of not being enough. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they were cursed with subjective attraction. Why does Eve cover up? Because she's ashamed of her body. Adam and Eve once judged their bodies by an objective standard of beauty that made them feel extremely comfortable with who they are because there was no comparison. That's the essence of objectivity. Subjective attraction is all about rampant comparison and we have been cursed with it till this very day. That was the curse of Adam and Eve. Seduction, born of a lack of chosenness, leading to subjective attraction and the kind of hatred of our bodies that we have until this very day, which is astonishing. With women bearing most of the brunt to continue to try to live up to an objective standard of beauty, regardless of how much work, quite literally how much work it requires. That's the curse of Adam and Eve as defined by Maimonides, which will lead to so much of the sexual villainy that will define humanity. So let me just identify three things that we speak about, that we, about sex at the very beginning of creation. The first thing we said is chosenness. The second thing we said was objective, subjective as opposed to objective attraction and how we all feel so bad about how we look and our bodies and we lack sexual confidence today. That's going to lead to all kinds of sexual shenanigans because people are easily seduced when they don't feel beautiful and suddenly someone tells them they are beautiful. It's very difficult to sustain monogamy, fidelity, and intimacy when in the intimate bond, you still don't feel special. And finally, number three. The biggest mistake we make about sex at the very beginning of creation is this false, ridiculous, non-Jewish idea that sex is for procreation. This has never been a Jewish idea. You do not make love to have children. Judaism is profoundly monogamous. There is Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Susan and Rebecca. And the ideal is monogamy. Later, Abraham marries Sarah. Again, it's entirely monogamous. Where does it go wrong? Sarah is the one who imposes a new woman on Abraham. Because she feels what? Come on, help me. Inadequate. And she doesn't understand the purpose of sex. She thinks it's about having a baby. So no matter how loving she is, and Adam is so attached to her. He may know your God, take Isha Yifas Marach. I know how beautiful you are. You're so gorgeous, even though you're in your late 80s, that I am afraid that the most powerful man on earth who could have any woman, any Egyptian woman, is going to kidnap you. That's how gorgeous you are. So she has a man who focuses on her and is attentive and romantic, romantically interested, erotically drawn to her. And yet, she continues to feel, again, one of those three things. Number one. I have no kids. I am profoundly inadequate. I'm not even a woman. Number two, I'm older. Take someone younger. You're a nobleman. You're rich. 
you, you, you deserve it. Interestingly, that becomes the first villainous act as far as sex is concerned in the Bible. The rise of polygamy that will undermine intimacy. That will make it more difficult for all of us to be faithful. And by the way, it leads to tremendous dysfunction in their marriage. Of course Sarah's going to be jealous. Of course Sarah's going to take it out on Hagar and on her child. Of course it's even going to make Abraham look bad. Abraham sends his son into the desert with nothing but a thermos of water. It's one of, one of the most difficult conundrums in the Bible that he could behave, at least seemingly, so cruelly with his own son. That's what happens when jealousy, feelings of inadequacy, and dysfunction enter into a relationship. Because they had a very functional marriage before them. And if they weren't blessed with children, you know what? The Lubavitcher Rebbe and his wife were, were not blessed with children. And he changed the whole Jewish world, including my own life. There are many couples who don't have children. And humanity becomes their children. It's a beautiful thing to have kids. We should do what we can. We should adopt, we should go to fertility trip. But at the end of the day, that's not why you make love. <coughs> it's a separate commandment. You make love to be intimate, to be bone of one bone, flesh of one flesh. You destroy that intimacy when you bring a third partner into the marriage. For whatever reason. Even today, if people use surrogates, and there's all these interesting a lot of questions, you don't have sex with a surrogate. Because you can't compromise the intimacy of that bond. So continue. Isaac and Rebecca, interestingly, completely monogamous. Jacob, the same mistake begins to happen. Leah feels very inadequate because Jacob has a romantic attachment to Rachel and wants to marry Rachel. Leah, her father's a, a trickster, a huckster. So Jacob marries the wrong person. But the longing of his heart is still for Rachel, leading Leah to a lifelong feeling of not being chosen. And here you see, she still feels loved. I mean, Jacob loves her. He's just not strongly drawn to her. He's not strongly attracted to her. There's communication, compliments. But when you don't feel chosen, you are miserable. And we see this deep misery in Leah, where she is only able to finally connect with her husband in death. That she's the one who will lie by him for all eternity. But fascinatingly, in like a great tragic drama, the apple of his eye, that woman he wants to be with, is still outside his reach. She is very far, far away. So that when we visit Keva Rachel these days, you actually feel that palpable sense of loneliness. You know who goes to Keva Rachel above all, above all else? It's women who want to get married. It's women who feel loneliness. Because we, we experience the desolation and isolation of Rachel. And then we have the story of Lot and his daughters, truly the most bizarre story in the entire Torah. Here's Lot being saved by the angels as they escape from Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's supposed to be different from Sodom and Gomorrah, and he ends up being incestuous with his own daughters. There's many disputes as to whether he was cognizant of the fact that he was sleeping with his own daughters and impregnating them. Certainly Rashi, based on the Medrash, believes the second time around he definitely was aware of it. Because when your own daughters are getting you totally sloshed, you know, usually it's the opposite. The father telling the daughter, stop drinking. And here it's the daughter telling the, the father, dad, start drinking. So his daughters get impregnated from him. Talk about sexual villainy. God almighty. It doesn't get worse than that. That is the single most bizarre story in the entire book of Genesis. It's even, it's even difficult to read it. When you finally come to the puzzle that says, and the two daughters of Lot became pregnant from their father. And this is Abraham's nephew. And the Talmud famously asks, why did we need to know this awful story? Look, what's that even doing there? Here we are, this exemplary story of good and evil that Sodom and Gomorrah are, are wicked and immoral and they're Barbarous, so God's going to destroy them. And, and, and Abraham launches this classic defense of human life. And he begins to argue with God. Aren't there 50 righteous people? Are there 40 righteous people? 30 righteous people? And finally, they settle on 10, and they can't even find 10 decent people in the entire city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So God re reigns fire and brimstone. And Lot's wife, who's cheap and miserly, she turns into 
a block of salt. The tradition saying that she wouldn't even give salt to her. You know, she'd give them food, but she wanted them to taste bad. She never wanted them to, to enjoy the experience in her home. And right after we finish all these lessons, we hear about two daughters who are virgins, seemingly underage, getting pregnant from their father. And the response given by the Talmud is fascinating. In essence, it says this. And it'd be interesting for me to hear if you agree. The Talmud says this story is there to teach us that we're all sexual villains. We all have, have an out of control sexuality. And it teaches us humility to know that the Messiah and King David, who will come from these unions, especially from Moab, because Ruth is a Moabite convert <coughs> that stopped judging other people's libidos. Stop judging other people's sexual indiscretions. Judge the action, to be sure. A man cheats on his wife, we must condemn it. A woman cheats on her husband, we must condemn it. But to condemn them, you must have humility. Because each of us possesses an out of control libido, and this is a normal story in the Bible, not, not incest, God forbid, but we can never, almost never control the thing about Judaism is that Judaism never suppresses our, our libido in any way whatsoever. Judaism channels our libido. Catholicism might ask us to suppress our libido lifelong if you want to be the Pope. Judaism considers that a sin, not to marry. Judea marriage is not a sacrament in our religion. It is a chiyuv, an obligation. A healthy sex life is critical to a healthy mental life, to a healthy emotional life. And husbands and wives have to be able to express the full panoply of, of sexuality so that they never become sexual villains. Which leads us to some of, I'm going to go out of order, but I want to prove my point. Let's go to the greatest story of sexual villainy in the entire Bible. <coughs> King David is the father of the Messiah. He is the creator of the first Jewish commonwealth. He plays the harp and the lyre. No man except Moses dominates Jewish history more than King David. And yet, amidst all the stories for which he is famous, Marrying Saul's daughter Michal and their beautiful love affair, and how it went so south. Creating a great Jewish kingdom, being an incredible warrior, killing Goliath, and Malcolm Gladwell just wrote a great book about that, which is a number one New York Times bestseller. Um, wanting to build the first temple, being denied because he was a man of war. Of all of those stories, what is the most famous story about King David? Hashem. Hashem. Greatest story of sexual villainy in the entire Bible. So much so that it will lead to consequences for the Jewish people that last till this very day. No matter how much David repents, and he becomes a model of repentance. You know, in the Kriya Shema Shalomita, if you say the prayers that we read, that we recite just before we go to sleep, after the evening prayer, after our week, and very few people say this. When I was young and really religious, I used to say it every night, and it, a, a large part of it consists of Psalm 51. You have to read Psalm 51 to understand the depths of the man's repentance. Begging God to forgive him. The kind of acknowledgement of sin, the responsibility he took was offering no excuses. Pleading, still the baby died. And still God ripped away half of his kingdom. He allowed half of it to remain because David was righteous. So he got Judah. But the ten tribes were lost. And they're lost to us till this day. We have no idea where they are. You may, may as well write them off. Every day someone else comes along claiming to be the ten lost tribes of Israel. I meet half of them when I'm on the New York subway. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is David, so what does David want? You're the king. You can have any woman. And you, he already has five wives. Five wives. Beautiful wife, wives. Abigail, Michal, princess. What do you need Hashem for? Don't tell me it's because you're on the roof. Of, of, the, of, the, of your palace, and you see her bathing, you can't believe that a man of David's discipline would suddenly just see a naked woman and can't control himself and immediately runs and indulges what is essentially an adulterous affair. I know the Talmud says that whoever says that David sinned is mistaken. Kaloimer. But you gotta also read, we have a tradition that you, no text loses its literal meaning. And literal meaning, he sends Uriah the Hittite to be killed on the front lines, and God certainly punishes him. So he has all these women, 
What does he want? Why Bathsheba? Help me or someone. Why her? Because she's so beautiful. The king can have it. It's good to be the king. The king can have anyone. This wasn't plain lust. What plain lust makes a man, makes a man rock the foundations of his kingdom? That is a lust. That is out of control, animal, carnal, something that we barely understand. It's that, it's that strong. Forbiddenness. He wants a married. Because the sinful, forbidden woman is so much sexier than the legal, permitted woman. Because everything for David is permitted, the only thing that Rod has left to him is that which is not permitted. It is specifically her married state which makes her even more erotically desirable. And that's why Monica Lewinsky was so interesting. Do you know how many of Bill Clinton's daughter, uh, 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 sorry, supporters, wives threw themselves at him? Or he, he was accused of affairs with them too. But Monica Lewinsky is the intern. I mean, talk about the single most forbidden thing that you can do. And there's a reason. You see, sexuality is something that makes us feel intensely alive. That's why we love sex. What leads sex to being the most pleasurable of all human experiences is that it's the only thing that awakens the beast within. We're no longer calculating our movements, our sounds, our, our, our articulation. It's all just guttural. It's surrendering something more powerful than us. And once you're so powerful that you control everything, you need to push the envelope beyond even that to find any kind of liberation. I can even break the rules. It's good to be the king. And that's why God comes, steps down so tough on him and says, no, the rules aren't yours to break. The kingship will be taken from you. You have abused it. The final biblical villain. Esther. What is Esther doing? Esther is a married woman. It's, it's not exactly in the text, but it's not a Medrash either. It is almost so obvious that her relationship with Mordechai is much more than an uncle and a niece. He brought her to his house. Bias is the universal Jewish euphemism for wife. Doesn't mean that a wife is very large, honestly. <laughs> You could see her reticence. You could see the way Mordechai checks up on her. The Talmud is clear that this isn't the Medrash. She is a married woman. The Talmud debates day and night how she could have submitted since she was a married woman. She is absolutely forbidden. And more than anything else, what is the nature of the attraction? Achashverosh can have any woman in Persia, 127 provinces. She is so mysterious. The word Esther means the hidden one. Her identity is hidden. Her birthplace is hidden. She speaks almost nothing about herself. And Ahasuerus is going crazy. She is this riddle that can't be solved. She is this nut that can't be cracked. Try as he might, he cannot figure her out. So here for the first time, he has encountered a woman who is not the end of an erotic adventure, but is the beginning of a romantic journey. And that's what makes her stand out. The mysteriousness, the forbiddenness. And the Talmud says, but if she's a married woman, here's the villainous part, how could she have sex with, no matter who, the guy's a king. But so what? So you would mostly respond, well, it's to save the Jewish people, you're allowed to do it. Perhaps there was that response. She didn't know it would lead to the salvation of the Jewish people. When she was taken in, Haman had not, not yet decreed that the Jews needed to be annihilated. The Talmud says something fascinating. It says that she was not culpable as a wife because when a woman is aroused sexually, even when she, she did not initiate it, she's aroused sexually, she's no longer responsible for what she does, interestingly. Because a woman has such a passionate, sex, passionate sexual nature. What a statement. Is that a compliment? Is it an insult? So if you say that Esther is aroused to a point where she can no longer, she's cacosolum, she's, she, she's passive. 
She's not doing it. She's receiving advances of a man. He's more powerful than her. He's the king. He can kill her. But once she gets into it, she gets into it. So half the people will say, that's an insult. But the other half might say, not such an insult. Because what is our assumption about female sexuality? Our assumption about female sexuality today is that men are the ones who are so sexual. And women kind of put up with it. We can debate whether this, I'm not going to give this a finality. Is it a, is it a compliment that that's, Esther can't resist, according to Talmud Iqbal, and is therefore exempt? Is it an insult? Is it a compliment that the Talmud will later say about Bruria, the most famous woman of the whole Talmud, that she was seduced by one of her, her husband's students, and that she became so ashamed when she succumbed, although the consensus opinion is that they didn't have sex, they didn't do anything, but she, she took her own life, killed herself. Half the schools in Israel are named after her, Bruria. My kids go to Bruria High School right now in New Jersey. My daughter went to Bruria in Israel. And yet her life ends with a suicide out of humiliation and shame of her sexual nature and having succumbed to the wiles of this man. And yet, that's how history begins with Eve as well. And so we tend to have this view. Women are temptresses. Women are seductresses. Mankind falls through Eve's seduction. And even virtuous women like Eve, when really, maybe perhaps it's the opposite. Maybe there's something, maybe, just something to think about. Maybe our humanity is defined not by our minds, as if Einstein were more human because he was smarter, but our, maybe our humanity is defined more by our hearts, as if Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama, who I just did a panel with two weeks ago, which is a great honor, maybe people like that, or Elie Wiesel, who I'm speaking with on a panel tomorrow night, God bless him, he's 85 years old, God bless him, he's our greatest Jewish living personality. Maybe they're more human because they have bigger hearts. And if that's true, then the person who cannot respond to affection, I don't mean, God forbid, sexual coercion, which is a, an abomination. I mean, in a normal situation, if a woman allows a man to approach her and make love to her, if a wife opens her heart to her husband and she falls in love with him, that's actually quite a blessing. It's where men force that to happen, where it is an abomination and sin. But we should never feel bad about our reciprocity, that we fall in love with love, that we love being loved, that we love sex, love romance. We have to stop being ashamed of this stuff as if our libidos are something disgusting. We're Jews. We don't think the libido is something sinful. We believe as long as it's channeled in a kosher manner, choice, love, marriage, fidelity, intimacy, not just for procreation, but to be bone of one bone and flesh of one flesh. Those are kosher expressions. So now you've seen that some of the sexual villainy that we've seen and some of the sexual heroism in the Bible comes specifically through not addressing core acceptable human needs or by indulging irrational non-kosher needs. And therefore, let us in the future always choose that's why I love the subject when it was given to me. Let us choose to be sexual heroes. Loving, loving husbands, loving wives, faithful and passionate, erotic and electrifying to each other exclusively. Let us choose to be sexual heroes and never sexual villains. Thank you very much. <laughs>